there's something about steam locomotives. Whether it's their inherent nostalgia-inducing qualities or how busy they look from both inside and out, they simply have more personality and soul than any other type of locomotive, and arguably, any other type of machine, period. But despite this, and the deep love that many have for them, we don't usually perceive them as high-energy adrenaline pumpers. Instead, we tend to think of them as pretty sedentary things, usually chugging away lazily in the background of a period drama or a wizard movie to create warm, fuzzy feelings about how lovely everything was in the olden days. It wasn't. But such a perception does a disservice to steam locomotives because when they had to, they could shift. They could really shift, as demonstrated no better than by this beast, the LNER Class A4, the single fastest steam locomotive that has ever been made. It's a pretty mad looking thing, isn't it? And no doubt you're wondering when it was built, why it was built, and what it got up to, and above all else, how fast was the bloody thing? Well, worry not, because those questions and more we're going to answer for you in the next 20 or so minutes, so let's get into it. Have you ever felt that your online privacy was slipping through your fingers faster than sand on a beach? Well, worry not, because there's a hero in the digital world. And that hero's name is Surfshark. Just imagine you're surfing the web, minding your own business, when suddenly, BAM! You're hit with a geo restriction. Maybe there's a hacker lurking around the corner, a dreaded price discrimination based on your location. With Surfshark, you can protect all of your internet shenanigans with just a click. No more worrying about who's snooping on your online activity or where you're connecting from. Also, say goodbye to FOMO. Whether you're traveling abroad or just chilling at home, Surfshark lets you access your favorite content from back home or different content if you are at home. And the best part, it's easy to use. Just download the app, tap a button, and voila. Instant privacy, instant security, instant access to a whole range of new content. And here's the cherry on top. With Surfshark, you get all of these perks without breaking the bank. Use the promo code MEGA for an extra three months for free. All you need to do is go to surfshark.deals forward slash mega to get started. Thank you to Surfshark for sponsoring today's video. And now back to it. The A4 was born from the mind of Sir Nigel Greasley, one of the UK's most distinguished locomotive engineers. Born on the 19th of June 1876 in Edinburgh, Scotland, he began his career right at the very bottom of the ladder, serving as an apprentice at the crew works of the London and Northwestern Railway. Given his famous love for birds, hence this statue, he ironically took to his new trade like a duck to water, and soon shot up the ranks, eventually becoming assistant superintendent of the carriage and wagon department of the Lancashire and Yorkshire Railway in 1904. Eventually, he became their chief mechanical engineer in 1911, a role that he retained when the company was amalgamated to become the London and Northeastern Railway, or LNER, during the 1923 grouping, which merged the UK's many railway companies into four mega companies. Now, naturally, this career path saw him have a dabble at locomotive design, although dabble might be underselling it somewhat, as he designed a total of 27 locomotives during his career, including some of the greatest to ever grace Britain's tracks, including the GNR Class A1 in 1922, which he would have eventually refined further into the LNER Class A3 of Flying Scotsman fame in 1927, the LNER Class W1 in 1929, an experimental class consisting of a single experimental locomotive that featured an ultra-high-pressure marine-derived boiler, the LNER Class P2 in 1934, a specialized express locomotive designed to tackle the hills of Scotland at high speed, and the LNER Class K4 in 1937, a masterfully designed mountain goat of a locomotive designed to absolutely demolish hills while tugging absolutely ungodly oddly amounts of weight. Now all things must come to an end. However, and so Greasley, with a lifetime of near unparalleled achievement under his belt, passed away on the 5th of April 1941 at the age of 64, and he is still fondly remembered to this day as one of the juggernauts of the golden age of British Railways. So now that we know about the man behind the drawing board, let's bring this chapter to a close and move on to have a look at the A4 he created. The A4 was about one thing and one thing alone – speed. Greasley was adamant from the offset that his A4 would be the fastest thing on rails, period. No ifs, no buts, 
no compromises. But even for a man such as him, blessed as he was with a brain of many wrinkles and a lifetime of experience added a drawing board, achieving such a thing would be quite the tall order, as come the 1930s, steam locomotive technology had more or less peaked, which meant that to achieve his goal, he would have to combine every advanced innovation that had come before and think outside of the box to squeeze just a bit more potential out of the technology. The one big innovation that came out of that thought process is immediately apparent when you behold the A4 streamlining. But despite the A4 going down as the streamlined locomotive in the minds of enthusiasts, it was actually not the first. That would actually be the Commodore Vanderbilt over in the United States, which first rolled out of the works back in 1934. The A4 was the first British streamlined locomotive, however, a fact that LNER was very keen to shout about at the time, as you can see on this period poster. And it was damn good streamlining too. Now, Sadly, we were unable to find the exact drag coefficient figures in our research, and frankly, with far too smooth brain to figure it out ourselves, but the following figures given by Roger Mannion in his book The Streaks makes it clear just how good it was. At 60 miles per hour, an A4 used 41 horsepower less than an A3 to maintain speed, 97 horsepower at 80 miles per hour, 190 at 100 miles per hour, and 253 at 110 miles per hour. And speaking of the A3, well that's a great segue to start discussing the A4's internal design, because it was, to simplify quite a bit, a streamlined A3 that Greasley went back over and modified to improve it here and there. Key differences include a smoke box, the bit on the front with the door on it that was chopped down in height to accommodate the streamlining, as seen more clearly in this photo of Mallard minus her cladding, a high-pressure boiler that could contain a greater quantity of steam to push on the pistons while generating motion, and an extended firebox, the bit of the cab that you chuck coal into, and this allowed for a bigger fire to be laid and thus generate more steam more quickly. It also had a larger fire brick arch. This is a device that literally does what it sounds like, and it aids combustion by simplifying a bit, forcing visible smoke which contains unburnt carbon particles which would normally be sucked straight through the fire tubes and out the chimney to stay in the fire for longer and thus get fully combusted, thereby making full use of the coal being burnt. And then there was its valve gear, valve gear being the machinery that takes steam from the boiler and puts it into the cylinder where, under pressure, it then pushes on the motion, the big system of rods that you see on the side of steam trains, which, because they are attached to the wheels, then turn them and move the whole thing along. When it comes to valve gear, the A4 uses Greasley's famous conjugated valve gear system. This allows a locomotive to have three cylinders but only two motions. To simplify quite a lot here, it uses a series of levers and linkages to apply the movement of the third cylinder's piston to both the left and the right-hand side motions. It's a genius bit of kit, as it vastly cuts down on weight, cost, and complexity of having to incorporate a traditional third cylinder, but still allows for all the same advantages in power. The weight point is particularly pertinent for the A4 too, because more lightness equals more fastness. Note, however, that Greasley's conjugated valve gear system was not unique to the A4, not by a long stretch, as he actually patented it all the way back in 1915 and used it on many of his other locomotives, such as the K4 W1 after its 1936 rebuild, and the A1 and A3. To increase their speed over distance, Greasley also made use of corridor tenders for the A4, these being exactly what they sound like. Tenders that have a very small corridor running through them, a genius invention that allowed for crews to be swapped out while a train was underway and thus saved time on having to swap out the crews. Like the conjugated valve gear, this was not an innovation unique to the A4, and it was something that Greasley incorporated on many of his locomotives intended for fast, long-distance express services such as the A3. Later, from 1938, the A4s would also begin to be upgraded with a car chap double chimney, a particular setup that, again, simplifying here, enhances a locomotive's efficiency by accelerating the exhaust steam through two separate chimneys, which improves the draft through the firebox and thus the combustion process, enabling the locomotive to generate more power with the same amount of fuel. As a result of all this, the A4 was, and still is, the pinnacle of steam locomotive design, combining efficiency, reliability, and above all else, speed, and a platform that has never been surpassed. But just how fast was it? Well, to answer that and more, let's bring this chapter to a close and move on to have a look at the history of the A4.
Come the 1930s, steam had ruled supreme for well over a century, but its position was beginning to look ever so shaky. The railways themselves were beginning to see increasing competition from both cars and airplanes, and even among trains, steam couldn't consider its position safe because diesel locomotives were just beginning to enter their earliest nascent stages, and what they promised threatened to blow steam out of the water. In Germany, for example, the futuristic-looking DR-877 entered service in May 1933, and it managed to happily sit at 85 miles per for long stretches of its initial Berlin to Hamburg route, a speed that all but the very, very best of steam locomotives simply couldn't match, even when they absolutely went for it, never mind maintaining it for long periods. Priestley himself rode on it while out on a jolly in Germany, and to say it made him furious would be a gross understatement. He was a patriotic Briton, one who was deeply proud of the UK's long since lost industrial might, and to him, the idea that Germany would be able to lay claim to having the greatest locomotives in the world was an insult equivalent to Hitler personally booting his door open and squeezing one out in his morning cornflakes. But he was also frightfully intelligent, and so he made note of the streamlined design of the 877, and when he got back to Blighty, he began giving thought to how he could make a steam locomotive with such a design. A lot of research, and even more math soon followed, after which he had a reasonable certainty that he could take his earlier A3 design, then the fastest locomotive on British railways, streamline it, tinker with its internals a bit, and so long as all of it was done properly, it would happily be able to pull up to nine carriages at the same speeds as the 877. A big deal indeed, given that the German upstart only operated in a two-car unit. He then took his musings to the directors of the LNER and tried to sell them on his dream. It wasn't a pitch that took terribly long, fueled by a dash of the same patriotic zeal that had set Greasley off back in Germany, and a big dollop of wanting to outcompete rival operators, they were immediately for it. And the fact that it was being pitched by Greasley, well, if anyone could pull it off, it would be him. And pull it off he did, as on 7th of September 1935, this absolute unit, Silverlink, the first of the A4s, rolled out of Doncaster Works and entered service. Contrary to how you might imagine, the new locomotive actually received quite a mixed reaction. Many saw it as a thing of awe pulled straight from science fiction, the objectively correct response to have when you see an A4, but many others weren't so keen, seeing it as LNER simply bowing to the streamlined craze or insisting that they had made a right pig's ear of the streamlining and got it all wrong. Such pessimism was short-lived, however, as only 20 days after Silverlink entered service, she would undertake a highly publicized demonstration run from London's King Cross to Grantham, during which she set a new speed record of 112 and a half miles an hour. Safe to say, nobody was whining after that. A further 34 A4s would soon join Silverlink by the time production ended in 1938, by which time A4s were reliably sitting at 90 miles per hour during routine operation, had slashed the London to Edinburgh journey time considerably, and had connected much of the rest of the country up with what many say is the world's first ever true high speed rail network. LMS were none too happy about all of that and were adamant that they would snatch the top speed crown for themselves, which led to them producing their own streamlined locomotive, the Coronation Class, in 1937, which then just grabbed the record in a demonstration run on the 28th of June, setting a new speed record of 140 miles per hour. This began an exchange of tit for tat between LNER and LMS, in which they both ran further demonstration runs, which made the record pass back and forth between them for a time. The final shot of this speed war would be taken by LNER on the 3rd of July 1938, when Mallard would set a steam record so high that it remains unbroken to this day. It took place on a section of the East Coast Main Line between Peterborough and Grantham by the name of Stoke Bank, and LNER weren't stupid. They chose this stretch of track for a very specific reason. It was long, it was straight, and it had an ever so slight downhill grade. Everything a locomotive needed to really put in a good performance. It also wasn't done with a normal passenger load. Instead, Mallard was pulling a light test train made up of six cars and a dynamo to measuring car, something which had become something of a standard in speed attempts. So, just how fast did it go on that attempt? That was 126 miles per hour, an absolutely insane speed for a steam locomotive, a bit of technology that, lest we forget, ultimately has its roots in the early 19th century. The intensity of the speed was also shown in Mallard's condition when she finally came to a halt. She'd taken quite a battering for her efforts, having overheated her middle cylinder bearing to the point that she had to be towed by another engine, and when the press had done their cooing, it was immediately sent back to the shed for nine days to have said bearing remetalled. But such quibbles mattered not, either to LNER, the public, nor the history books. The A4s had done it and earned their place as the fastest steam locomotives ever. 
Despite the gravity of this achievement, Greasley himself still wasn't satisfied and was convinced that his locomotive still had more speed to give, and so he lobbied successfully to have another crack at it. One problem, that run ended up being penned in for September 1939, and so, yeah. Well, that didn't happen for obvious reasons. Instead, the A4s would be called up to do their part in the war effort, and sadly, the war wasn't terribly kind to them. Cosmetically, they were absolutely desecrated. Their beautiful array of silver, green, and blue liveries were all caked over in thick, rusted coating of black to make them less visible during night attacks. Their flush side skirts were removed to make maintenance easier and quicker, and just to really rub salt into the wound, they even had their whistles stripped out due to fears that they would be mistaken for air raid sirens. As for their extra service during the war, they found themselves pushed into all manner of roles and routes for which they were never designed. You see, business demands for express intercity routes that was the A4's bread and butter was not really a thing during total war. These irregular services could be everything from running urban evacuees out to remote rural stations in the middle of nowhere, down branch lines that would have never seen an A4 normally, and could often barely fit them due to the tight turns. Bizarrely, contrary to what you might think, thanks to their raw, unbridled power, the A4s were actually pretty crazy crap at pulling freight, at least compared to other engines their size. This is because dedicated freight engines such as the LNER Q6 were usually designed to have lots of small wheels to maximize track contact, and thus how much power they could put down to pull their often 1,000 ton plus loads rather than passengers or mixed freight locomotives, which used larger wheels that reduced the rotational speed of the wheel for a given train speed and thus allow for more efficient operation at high speeds. One A4 was even destroyed during the war, specifically Sir Ralph Wedgwood, which was blown up during an air raid in June 1942. Come the end of the war, then the beginning of nationalization in 1948, the surviving A4s would all be given much needed overhauls and be returned to the duties that they were originally intended for fast, inner city, passenger express services. In a bizarre twist of irony, however, the very war which had put them through so many ordeals would be the very thing that bought them a few more years of service. As we have already discussed, before the war, diesel was the future, and everyone knew it, and locomotives such as the A4 and the Coronation class were meant to be the last hurrahs of steam. One final crack of the whip to show what the increasingly obsolete technology could do at its very best. The war saw such thoughts put on hold, however, and come its conclusion, when big sweeping thoughts of modernization could once again be entertained, everyone still knew that diesel was the future, but now there was bugger all money to achieve that future, and so the A4s remained in service until 1966, when they were finally replaced by the Class 55, a diesel locomotive that is better by every metric, and yet, tragically, it's so soulless that it inspires few of the passions of its forerunner. Fortunately, however, their withdrawal from service didn't quite close the book on the A4's story, as six of the 35 built survived the wrath of the scrapmen and survive to this very day, with some of them even being kept in working order. Bitten was restored to full working order in 2007 until she once again found herself confined to the shed when her mainline ticket expired in 2015, although plans are afoot to return her to steam in the next few years. Mallard was similarly restored in 1986 so that she could be in full working order for the 50th anniversary of her record-breaking run after which she was confined to the National Railway Museum and left to sit around looking pretty until the current day. The train Union of South Africa had a good run of it in preservation and was in and out of steam pretty much since the day she left mainline service. Big time in 2021, and she now seems fated to spend the rest of her time confined to museums. Dominion of Canada has never really run since being withdrawn from service, but remains in good cosmetic condition after being gifted to her namesake country in 1966. Dwight D. Eisenhower was gifted to the US after being withdrawn from service in 1963. She has never been run on the mainline since, but remains in great condition inside and out, and if rumors are to be believed, remains in near steamable condition. Then there is Sir Nigel Greasley, which, perhaps befittingly given its namesake, has been very busy in preservation, having been mainline running pretty much since the day she was pulled from service. She remains in full working order to this day and can often be found either at heritage railways across the UK or pulling special mainline charter services. All six of these locomotives were reunited at the National Railway Museum in York for an event dubbed The Great Gathering in 2013, and from the fact that you could barely move for people crammed shoulder to shoulder during it, it appears safe to say that the love for history's fastest steam locomotive is definitely here to stay.